Doctors of Reddit, what is the biggest mistake you've made, serious? Not a big mistake but definitely awkward at the time. I was gluing up a lac on a 14 year girl's forehead. Anyone who has used Dermabond before knows that stuff can be runny and bonds very quickly. I glued my glove to her face. Her mum was in the room, and I had to turn to her and say I'm sorry, I've just glued my glove to her face. <laughs> Pathologist here. Biggest mistake I ever made was cutting myself during an autopsy on an HIV patient. Lucky for me, I did not acquire the virus, so everything had a happy ending. For me, anyway, that guy was still dead. I missed a gunshot wound once. A guy was dumped off at the air covered in blood after a rap concert. We were all focused on a gunshot wound with an arterial bleed that was distracting. The nurse placed the blood pressure cuff over the gunshot wound on the arm. We all missed it because the blood pressure cuff slowed the bleeding. I was doing the secondary assessment when we rolled the patient, and I still missed it. We didn't find it till the chest x-ray. The bullet came off rest in the posterior portion of the thoracic wall without significant trauma to major organs. The patient lived, but I still feel like I fricked up big time. I was working in the air when a guy came in for a scratch on his neck and feeling drowsy. We start the usual workups and this dude's blood pressure tanked. We scrambled, but he was dead within 10 minutes of walking through the door. Turns out the scratch was an exit wound of a .22 caliber rifle round. The guy didn't even know he'd been shot. When the coroner's report came back, we found that he'd been shot in the leg and the bullet tracked through his torso shredding everything in between. There was really nothing we could have done, but that was a serious what the frick just happened moment. <laughs> this thread is pretty depressing, so I'll lighten it up a bit. A few months ago, I accidentally ran a creatinine test on a patient when a comp metabolic wasn't ordered. It turns out that the guy was in renal failure, and no one knew. He was about to go in for surgery, I believe it was a bypass, it could be wrong, but I got the results in in time to stop them from putting him under. Crap could have been messy, I'm glad I screwed up, and I'm sure he has no idea that he could have died. My brother is a surgeon, and during part of his residency, he had to work in the pediatric unit. He was working with two newborns, one was getting much better and fighting for life. He was going to make it just fine. The other baby was ours from death. He wasn't going to make it. My brother was in charge of informing the families. My brother realized about 15 minutes later that he had mixed up the families. He told the family with the healthy baby that their baby wasn't going to make it, and he told the family with the dying baby that their baby was going to be just fine. He then had to go back out to the families and explain the situation to them. How devastating. To be given a glimmer or hope and have it ripped away from you not even an hour later. That was most upset I've heard my brother. He felt destroyed. As a very young doctor in training I misdiagnosed a woman with epilepsy. Some years prior she had sustained a gunshot wound to the frontal area. Damaging the underside of one of her frontal lobes and severing an optic nerve to one of her eyes. As well as some of the muscles that rotated that eyeball. Surgery saved her life but the frontal lobe was scarred and the eye was blinded and always pointed down and at an angle away from her nose. A few years after that she began having spells of a bizarre sensation. Altered awareness. A pounding in the chest. And she had to sit down. Stop what she was doing. And couldn't speak. These were odd spells and I assumed she had developed frontal lobe epilepsy from the scar on her brain. Increasing doses of anti-seizure drugs seemed to work initially. But then the spells came back. A couple years after my diagnosis her endocrinologist, who treated her for diabetes mellitus, checked her thyroid. It was super high. The spells were manifestations of hyperthyroidism. She drank the radioactive iodine cocktail which ablated her thyroid, got on thyroid replacement therapy, and felt well thereafter. No permanent harm done and she was able to come off the anti-epilepsy drugs. She was obese, not the typical skinny hyperthyroid patient, and if she developed thyroid eye disease, I couldn't tell because her one eye was already so messed up. I see how I screwed it up. But in retrospect I have never been sure what I could have done differently, except test her thyroid at the outset of treatment. Hence, a lot of patients, thousands, have had their thyroid checked by me since then. Every so often I pick up an abnormality and it gets treated. The lady was an employee of the hospital where I trained and I ran into her one day. She gave me a hug and let me know how this had all gone down. 
She made a point of wanting me to know she didn't blame me because I always seemed to care about her and what happened to her. I think about her, and how I screwed up her diagnosis and set back her care, almost every day. I am a much better diagnostician now but I always remember this case and it reminds me not to get cocky or be too sure that my working diagnosis is correct. My mom just retired as an objin and she told me about a time early on in her career when, while not a real medical mistake, she still almost ruined the operation. She was performing a c-section I think, and she dropped her scalpel on the floor. Before she could think, she blurted out oh crap as a reaction. The mother, thinking something was wrong with the baby, started panicking. It took a team of nurses, the husband, and the mother of the patient to calm her down. Farmed here couple different quick stories. Heard of a pharmacist who filled a fentanyl patch incorrectly and the dose was so high that the patient went into severe respiratory depression and died. They're still practicing. Worked with another pharmacist back in the mid 2000s when I was still a tech who filled a script for Prozac solution. Concentrated it is 20 milligrams per ml. Average adult dose is 20 milligrams. Instead of 1 milliliter once daily he filled it for 1 teaspoonful. 5 ml. The child got serotonin syndrome and almost died. He is no longer working to my knowledge. My husband nearly died of a fentanyl overdose after a rookie EMT was allowed to administer it via injection. She gave him 4 times the safe dosage. That's some serious crap. My grandmother has had diabetes for about 20 years and takes a handful of meds to help control it. About 10 years ago, she developed a persistent cough. It wasn't bad. She said it felt like a constant tickle in the back of her throat. She went to her doctor to find out what was going on, and he ordered a battery of tests concerned that she was developing pneumonia, lung cancer, etc. All the tests came back negative, so he prescribed a cocktail of pills to help combat it. Over the span of 5 years, she had tried about 35 different meds and none helped. One day when she went it for a routine checkup, her normal doc was out and she saw one of the on-call residents. He looked at the barrage of pills she was on and asked why. When she explained, he replied, Oh, the cough is a side effect of this one particular drug you on to regulate your insulin. If we change you to this other one, it will go away. I have noticed that when I see a new doctor because mine is on vacation I often get new and important information. My parents are nurses. They knew a doc who'd been on a 36 hour shift. Patient came in with a punctured lung. I think, and the doc had to collapse the lung to fix whatever was wrong with it. Through tiredness he collapsed the wrong lung, and the patient died. Doc ended up killing himself after being fired. Don't burn yourself out. Someone else tragically lost their life years ago but the incident saved my sister's life about 10 years later. Several years ago, my sister and I were in a car accident. I had visible injuries, she did not and was walking around without any problems. So we thought, 9 days later, she was preparing dinner, began to feel ill, vomited and then passed out. She was taken by ambulance to the hospital emergency and after talking to my brother-in-law for only a couple of minutes, he rushed my sister into surgery and removed her spleen immediately. It had ruptured in the accident but was a slow bleed. My sister was in IQ for a couple of weeks but survived and is in good health today. Later. The admitting trauma surgeon said he recognized what was happening because of a mistake his college professor told the class she made as a surgeon years earlier. A teenage boy had fallen from a cliff and hit rocks below. Other than being bruised he was fine so did not seek medical help. Seven days later he was brought unconscious into a where the college professor was working as a surgeon at the time. She and her team were not able to quickly identify his symptoms of a ruptured spleen that had happened seven days ago. The teenage boy died about an hour later. She was always sure to share this particular incident with her students, thus saving my sister's life when one of her former students, my sister's doctor, showed up to class that day. As an IQ nurse, I've seen the decisions of some doctors result in death. Families oftentimes don't know, but it happens more than you think. It usually happens on very sick patients that ultimately would have died within 6 months or so anyway. Though, procedural wise, I have seen a physician kill a patient by puncturing their heart while placing a pleural chest tube. It was basically a freak thing as apparently the patient had recently had cardiothoracic surgery and the heart adhered within the cavity at an odd position. 
I'll never forget the look on his face when he came to the realization of what had happened. You rarely see people accidentally kill someone in such a direct way. Heartbreaking. I'm a nurse. I've given an anticoagulant, blood thinner, to the wrong patient. Over the, the next day his red blood count dropped. He ended up in IQ. My first day as a camp nurse for people with intellectual disabilities I gave 9 pills to the wrong guest. I didn't know who I was looking for and asked my friend to send out the guest. His hypochondriac roommate walks out, tells me he is the person I'm looking for. I asked my friend for confirmation who thought the correct person had come to me and confirmed from afar that it was, and I administered the meds. He had a lot of drug allergies. Stomach dropped when the actual person I was looking for came out 12 seconds later. Luckily, we called poison control and most of the pills were vitamins and the ones that weren't were either similar to ones the guy was already taking, or in therapeutic low dose form. He was fine and still continued to ask for everyone else's pills at all times. Worked there two summers and thankfully had no other disasters like this one. Hey, at least your mistake was a valid one. He claimed he was the kid you were looking for. I had a short stay at a psych facility, a home style place, and they attempted to give me someone else's drugs, very different, different DX entirely, and tried to shush me when I balked at first. I've posted this before, but I'll copy it here. I had a 9 year old girl bought in one night with her parents complaining of fever and respiratory distress, presenting with coughing and wheezing. The kid was really out of it and the parents were very upset, I thought it was bronchitis. But I admitted her and ordered treatment for her fever and cough as well as throat cultures. I was with another patient when the kid started hallucinating, sobbing and spewing everywhere. I figured it had to do with the fever, so I packed her with ice, but she died maybe a half hour after that. This wasn't my first death, but it was one of the worst. I couldn't tell the stiff neck since the kid was out of it. She also couldn't tell me anything else that would point to simple or complex seizures. She died of Neisseria meningitidis, completely wrong diagnosis. To make matters worse, we called in all her schoolmates and anyone else we could wake up just in time to see three other kids go. The rest got antibiotics quickly enough. Probably my worst day in medicine. Had to look that disease up. Holy crap. Doctors of Reddit, what's something someone came to the hospital for that they thought wasn't a big deal but turned out to be much worse? Had a guy come in complaining of a cough and difficulty swallowing. He thought he had tonsillitis and just wanted some antibiotics. I noticed his voice was incredibly hoarse but there were no swollen tonsils so sent him for a chest x-ray. Huge, baseball sized tumors all throughout his lungs. One of them was pressing on the recurrent laryngeal nerve causing his speaking and swallowing problems. He died within a week. Well this red is terrifying. My best friend's sister went to the hospital for what she thought was a lingering flu. She walked out with a diagnosis of bowel, stomach and liver cancer and died 9 months later. My dad went into the hospital in some pain. Back when he used to power lift, a nurse comes into the room, looks down at her chart, looks back up and says, Mr. Pickle you are having a heart attack. He got up on the bed and flexed saying, does this look like a man that's having a heart attack to you? She looked back down at her chart, up again, and says yes. Sir, this is a no flex zone. Not a doctor, I'm an EMT, but when I was deployed to Afghanistan as a medic, a medevac pilot came in because he had a small abnormality on his flight physical EKG. Apparently this was something he had been getting waivers for years for. I had just finished an A&P class and learned about something called Brugada's syndrome which is basically an arrhythmia that causes sudden cardiac death in the patient. I jokingly mentioned how his EKG reminded me of the abnormality I saw in my textbook, thinking there was no way he actually had it and it had to be artifact from the EKG. The doctor's eyes widened and he sprinted out of the office. The pilot had it, was immediately relieved of flight duty, sent home and had a defibrillator put into his heart before being medically retired. Good for you, you saved his life. My sister-in-law thought she had a cyst on her shoulder. Nope, round cell sarcoma. The doctor said she had 2 months, she lived for 8. When I was doing my hospital placements, a patient came in laughing and skipping for their scan. They thought 100% they were in remission and clear of cancer growth. I was spending a day with the scan techs, and sat in. The scan didn't show one tumor, 
It showed hundreds. The guy was riddled with metastases. It was terminal. He had months. He was laughing and smiling with us. He asked if we could tell him how it went, and the tech said we couldn't. It was for the doctor. The old man winked at us and walked out. He was so happy. It was one of the days that told me I couldn't do that job. My mother woke up one day and her arm was numb. After about 45 minutes it was still pretty numb and she thought she had pinched her nerve in it sleeping, but went to the adjust in case. She had a stroke, which actually was caused by a blood clot, which moved up from her heart, and exited a hole in her heart. A congenital defect she was unaware she had. She ended up fine and feeling in her arm came back, but she was incredibly lucky that it did. When I was 12 I had a crazy bad headache that wouldn't go away. My dad brought me to the dock and I didn't even make it to the exam room before they turned me back and sent us to the hospital. It turns out my headache was from a burst sinus cavity. As in all the bones around my eye broken the liquid leaked back onto my brain giving me brain meningitis. My eye was bulging out to the point where I looked like an alien and they told my parents I was not going to make it. Obviously I pulled through but was hospitalized for 2 weeks and missed 2 months of school. I was at the time only the third known case of this happening and they had flown in doctors from all over the US and from the UK. Crazy stuff. I thought it was just the worst headache. Turned out to be so much more. The 7th of December. 2012, we brought my father-in-law to the air because he just wasn't acting right mixing words, feeling tired. My husband and I thought for sure he had a mild stroke. The air staff thought he had a stroke too, because of his symptoms and he was 79. They did a scan and nope, cancer, three huge tumors in his brain. We took him for more tests the next day and it was lung cancer, a tiny spot in his lung that traveled to his brain. He died 13 days later on my husband's birthday. I'm on a nurse. I cared for a patient that came in because she woke up with a severe headache and a knot on her head. She went to CT for a head scan and had two bullets in her head. One had gone in at the top of her head, just past her hairline and traveled under the skin, but on top of her skull to the back of her head. The other went straight in, but just fractured the skull behind her ear, didn't go all the way through the skull. They were smaller caliber bullets, apparently. She went to sleep the night before after taking an Ambien and there was a drive-by shooting on her street. The bullets went through her window and she slept right through it. Note to self, never take Ambien you will go into a freaking coma. Patient presented with a small, less than 1 inch, scratch on his right thigh and severe pain and immobility. On palpation there was crepitus, a cracking sound. We called in a surgeon in the hopes that we could excise the closed wound, but as soon as the surgeon cut the skin the leg deflated. Yes deflated. The escaped air was horribly putrid in odor. We ordered an x-ray and discovered the leg was simply skin and bones without any signs of muscle. I regretfully informed the patient that we had a strong suspicion of a flesh-eating bacteria called Clostridium perfringens and that the infection was spreading fast. He called his family and loved ones got a lawyer and said his goodbyes. 12 hours after admission he was declared dead. Um, where is this bacteria commonly located? My friend's mother was on vacation in Key West and as they were walking down the beach her husband pointed out that the toes on her left foot were all sandy and the other one wasn't. She had been kind of dragging the front of her foot, but only on the one leg. The mom vaguely mentioned that she'd been kind of having a little trouble lifting the front of her foot up but figured she just strained something from running barefoot on the beach a few days earlier. She went to a doctor to see if she could get some anti-inflammatories. After questions and recommendations to see a specialist, they figured out that she has ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. This was 6 years ago. Now she is totally unable to move, talk, and breath on her own. All she thought she had was a sprained foot. I thought I had a nasty flu strain, was feeling generally like crap. Didn't go to hospital until 2 days later, was in operating room less than an hour after that. Appendicitis. Appendicitis is evil. I thought I had food poisoning. I was in a fender bender car accident. I was at fault and my lower back would not stop aching. I went into the figuring I had sprained the muscles in my back and that I would be prescribed muscle relaxers and maybe some pain pills. 6 hours. Several x-rays. A cat skin and 4 doctors later. I found out my spine was broken and, get this, 
healed. The best theory any of them could come up with was that my spine had broken during birth and since we never knew, it just healed itself, filling in with cartilage. One of the docs told me that had we known my spine broke at birth I would have likely never walked and would have been treated as handicapped my whole life. I didn't find out until I was 20 and already had a child. My mom cried because she always thought I was just a really colicky baby, when in fact I was probably in a lot of pain. That's really sad, and terrifying. Parental guilt is horrible. Paramedic here. We got called out one Christmas for a grandfather who was tired after eating a huge turkey dinner. We get there and the first responders are standing around outside in high spirits. I walk in, slap a EKG on him. Massive MI. Heart attack. Went from happy turkey coma to heart attack in 3 seconds. Frick it. If I'm going to die, let it be after a fantastic Thanksgiving dinner. This one isn't nearly as scary as the others, and I'm pretty late to the party, but here's my story. I have male pattern baldness, and needed a prescription for some hair growth medication from a dermatologist. The doctor said he would give me a prescription, but first wanted to do a full skin checkup, which he does for every new patient. I got annoyed by the fact that I had to strip naked in front of this guy just for hair medicine. A few weeks later I get a call. There was melanoma cancer on my back. They caught it early enough that it hadn't spread. That checkup saved my life. Doctors of Reddit. Scare the crap out of me. This is like the web of Reddit. A year or two ago here in Texas a woman went to her optometrist for a regular exam. She later told the news after a long silence he asks, Did you drive here? Number. The person who drove you here needs to drive you to a hospital immediately. Why? Because you're about to have a stroke. That's amazing but also scary as heck. Imagine knowing the entire way to the hospital. My doctor told me if I had waited 12 more hours I probably would have died. So I was taking antibiotics for dental work that had been done. And notice these weird blisters showing up everywhere. Weird, but whatever. 48 hours later, they started opening up, leaving holes in my skin. No blood, just lost most of the skin in that area. Again, weird, but I was working so whatever. Then they started appearing in my throat so I got to the hospital ASAP and was diagnosed immediately with Steven Johnson syndrome. Any longer and the layers of my skin would have literally peeled away from each other and I would have died. That was a sobering day. After I got my appendix out I went back a week later thinking I was constipated. Nope. I had a giant ass abscess that had started to wall itself off. They went in the drain it and I woke up in IQ 5 days later recovering from sepsis, septic shock and kidney failure. She thought she had pneumonia. Turns out it was stage 4 lung cancer. She was 31. For instance I thought I had food poisoning. Then they emergency took out my appendix at 1am. I saw a 55ish woman at the year last year. She asks us if she might have something wrong with her breast. During my exam, I couldn't help but notice that her left breast was bumpy, talking like 5 centimeters mass protruding, the nipple was inverted and leaking blood, clearly a textbook case of cancer. The woman had a pretty high paying job and seemed pretty smart, and was clearly in denial. I had gallstones for 3 years or so before I finally got my gallbladder ripped out last year. At its worst, I was getting an attack maybe once a month or so, so I figured it couldn't be that bad. I went to the surgeon for my post-op checkup. He told me that my gallbladder was filled with hundreds of stones of varying sizes and that it was precancerous. Apparently, people don't typically get gallbladder cancer until they are in their 80s or 90s. And it is often very serious because people don't catch it right away. I'm in my 20s and like I said, I had been sitting on this problem for 3 years for I finally toughened up enough to get it checked out. Scary crap man. My girlfriend is in here final rotations for radiology. A while back a young girl came in after winning a basketball championship. She had some shooting shin pain but wasn't in a lot of pain. Still glowing from the win and talking excitedly about a scholarship offer. When her scan came back about 60% of the marrow in her tibia was one big sarcoma. Cancer. Surgery and therapy essentially ended her shot at a full ride. I'm not a doctor but a few years ago I took a positive pregnancy test. I went to the doctor to confirm just thinking I would be getting some blood work done and maybe an ultrasound. 
They did the ultrasound but couldn't find a baby in my uterus so they told me it was ectopic, implanted in a fallopian tube, and I needed to have surgery to remove the baby. I went into surgery and woke up a few hours later. The first thing I remember is seeing my parents and my fiancé crying. Turns out I was never pregnant. I actually had a tumor the size of my fist on my ovary and my body was reacting to it like a baby. I had an HCG hormone and everything. I'm 4 and 1 stroke 2 years in remission. My aunt fell down some stairs or something in January 2011. It really wasn't serious at the time we thought. Apparently her hips started not feeling right after that. She went to the doctor about it in the end of July-ish. She had cancer. It was everywhere. She was dead by September. You know people can go fast sometimes but we were not prepared for that. One night, I suddenly had serious stomach pains. After failing to sleep it off, my parents wanted me to stay home from school, but I declined for I had quizzes that day. I sat through US history, algebra 2, and even tried to eat lunch. Still in agony. So, after finishing my English quiz, I waddled down to the office and called my mom to get me. At this point, the pain is so bad I can barely stand. So my mom takes me to the doctors. Turns out, my appendix was ready to explode. You should have waited a little bit longer, you would have felt a lot better. My mother was in town visiting for Christmas. Suddenly she was slurring her speech, acting belligerent, and all around confused. Tested her blood sugar and all it said was error. We get to the ear and she passed out. Her blood sugar was a 19. Her liver spontaneously failed. The best the doctors can guess is she caught a virus and it attacked her liver. Four days after the onset she got a liver transplant. A 22 year old woman in Baton Rouge, Louisiana gave my mother the ultimate gift. Please. Become an organ donor. Please. 16 yo here. Got my license like 3 weeks ago. Already an organ donor. My basic thinking is if I'm dead I don't need them anymore. Doctors of Reddit. What was your dumbest R I am verismat patient experience? RN here. I see some crazy stuff. But one thing that stands out was the time I was admitting a guy to the hospital. I can't really remember what for but he was about 400 pounds. Diabetic. Heart disease. You name it. Anyhow I'm at the computer going over some admission questions with him and his 10 family members who are crowded in the room with him. A few minutes and he starts complaining that he's thirsty. He needs something to drink right now. So I get on my phone and call the nurse assistant and is her to bring in some ice water. As soon as the words are out of my mouth the whole family screams N O O O O. No water. He's allergic to water. Well this is gonna be a problem. Turns out the guy had been drinking nothing but Sprite and sweet tea for years because of his water allergy. The next question the wife had was where are we all supposed to sleep the whole family? 10 people were planning to stay at a hospital with him. Was working at a clinic. I was speaking with a non-controlled diabetic patient about her sugar intake and she said she drinks a 32 ounce soda every day. I ask her if it's regular or diet and she replies with it's half regular. I let the ice melt first so there isn't as much sugar in it. Sorry but that isn't how it works. I have had several arguments with diabetics about coke kool-aid sweet tea versus those made with artificial sugar. I tell them, look, don't drink sugar, if you have to have something like that. Use an artificial sweetener. No way. That stuff is poison. It will kill me mom. Your A1C is 14. Sugar is already killing you. I had a patient who was a completely non-compliant diabetic. Smoker. Morbidly obese. Who had his first heart attack at 45. His blood pressure was also super high. And instead of taking his antihypertensive medications. He went to the gym. In the gym. He would sit in the sauna for a very long time and sweat a lot and lower his blood pressure by becoming dehydrated. I have one. I got this from my friend who is a doctor on the children's ward in a rural hospital. These parents bring in their child whose hair is infested with lice. The lice was visible to the naked eye and could be seen crawling on the child's clothing. While the medical staff examined the child, in order to determine a course of action, they discovered the child was covered in a white powder and smelled heavily of chemicals. They asked the parents what were the substances and the smells emanating from the child. The parents said, quite matter of fact, it was savine powder and flea and tick spray they used on their dogs on the family's farm. Needless to say, social workers were notified about this case. 
had a neighbor in rural Tien who was convinced that the best way to treat her child's head lice was to comb diesel fuel through it, and that doing it in an enclosed living room while smoking cigarettes was acceptable. She was baffled when CPS took her kid away. 70 year female tripped and fell two days ago. She came it with hip pain but reports after the fall her nose was bleeding, she had landed on her nose. About a year prior her dentist had messes up an infraorbital nerve block and caused some swelling in that region but that all was resolved. This old lady is now convinced her nosebleed after falling on her face is related to an infection from the dental issue a year ago. After multiple back and forth on the etiology of the nosebleed, she became the first patient I raised my voice and put down an authoritative no, you are wrong. Just stop it. This has got to be the medical equivalent to the update you installed on the computer a year ago is making it run funny. Get over here and fix it. I work for an optometrist and it was the month before school started and a woman brought in her son to have his eyes checked for the first time. Seems like a pretty reasonable thing for any parent, even if he was a little older than usual for a first eye exam. Better late than never I guess. The mom was well spoken and appeared fairly intelligent. Everything went as normal. The doctor examined the boy and ended up prescribing glasses. When the doctor was explaining to the mom that her son had to wear his glasses all the time since he's nearsighted and basically can't see clearly past 5 feet in front of him. And will definitely need glasses for school. For some reason this caused a switch to flip in the moment she spazzed out on the doctor, saying that her son doesn't need glasses and that the doctor is only saying that he does because he wants to sell glasses. She says that she only brought her son in because there was some form for school that needed to be filled out and that doctors are all a con artist trying to push unnecessary medications and interventions. The doctor tried to calm her down and explain that he's only trying to help them but that she was free to get a second opinion and gave her a copy of the kid's prescription and sent them on their way. About 4 months later the lady is back asking for another copy of her son's prescription. Apparently the first semester midterm results were in. And her son failed them all, because he couldn't see the board in his classes and needs glasses. Not a doctor but I'm a nurse who worked in the Orita Trauma Center, was doing surgery on a 19 year old who tested positive for MNC who was grilling the anesthesiologist about every drug we were going to use in surgery because he doesn't like putting chemicals in his body. Gotta stick with that organic, fair trade, non-GMO coke. Most of my own stories go along similar lines to patient has chest pain driving a coach load of school children, thinks it's indigestion, swigs bottle of gun, later diagnosed with a huge heart attack. My favorite ever story from a colleague, a patient comes into A&E with abdominal pain. As part of the workup he gets an abdominal x-ray which shows the problem as clear as day. The colleague has then proceeded to remove, from the patient's rectum, an 8 inch replica of Nelson's column. The statue in the center of Trafalgar Square, London, on showing it to the patient. The response was oh that's Nelson, he lives up there. I've got two stories that stick out in my mind. The first is the mother of a toddler who came into Emerg. The kid had cruddy green bloody stuff coming out of his left nostril, and a lot of redness and swelling of only the left side of his nose and the adjacent cheek. Mum was sure he caught a sinus infection and just wanted some antibiotics. Now I know some kids like shoving whatever will fit into their body orifices, and that this was more than likely given the one-sided nature of his condition. But mom was insistent that he never puts things in his nose. It took some convincing, but I finally got her to let me take a look. Gave a squirt of my dazzlam in the good nostril to settle him. Then dug with some tweezers through the crud until I pulled out a big Olay button battery. It would have been burning his nose for a couple days. Hopefully he healed up well. Side note if a kid swallows a button battery, it can do a similar thing to their esophagus. This is an emergency and needs to be dealt with ASAP. Patient had a hard time getting pregnant. Finally conceived but miscarried. Patient has a DNC so she can try again, this time with medical intervention. We monitor her blood to ensure the pregnancy hormone is gone before beginning treatment. But she keeps coming back with higher levels of hormone. Docs are worried because she might have some retained placenta or pituitary disorder and this could be super bad for future fertility. We call her in for a conversation about the hormone levels not going away. After talking together about what might be wrong, they are going to go home and think about further tests. She says I need to go. I have an appointment at the weight loss center for an HCG shot. 
Turns out that she is on the HCG diet. HCG is the pregnancy hormone. And this was after an hour of the doc saying we don't know why you have these constant higher levels of HCG in your blood and we are worried. Patient inquiring about birth control was Adam and she wanted an ID. I mean, she probably wouldn't get pregnant after that. Had a young woman with recurring uters that began after a recent partner and with no STDs. Went through the standard questions trying to figure out what could be causing them and eventually found out she had been lubricating with jelly. Not KY jelly. The mix up had literally been a joke on house. It took me some effort to keep a straight face. But we eventually resolved the problem and she stopped getting uties. Oh lord, I'm British so didn't think jam straight away and was just imagining someone trying to get jello type jelly to stick to their bits. Oh, I have two good ones that come to mind. Clinical pharmacist here BTW with one story in the ear and one in the pharmacy. One a physician told me this one. 16 year old boy presented to the ear with an extremely swollen discolored penis. Apparently he has been using his mom's insulin needles to draw blood out of his arm and inject it into his own penis. He thought that adding blood would help increase his size. His penis was terribly infected and he was hospitalized for a week or so. 2. One day in the pharmacy, a girl comes to the counter requesting a refill for her birth control. We pulled up her profile and realized we couldn't refill it because she just got a 28 day fill less than 2 weeks ago. When we asked what happened to the other one, she said she was out. Apparently, both her and her boyfriend were each taking a pill each and was adamant that was how they needed to prevent pregnancy. Comma apparently he has been using his mom's insulin needles to draw blood out of his arm and inject it into his own penis. His penis was terribly infected and he was hospitalized for a week or so. Frick that is just gruesome. I work in the air. We had a very pregnant patient come in needing stitches in her vagina. Turns out she was a realtor and didn't want her water to break while she was showing a house. So she put a glass cup in her pants to catch the water. Instead of using a pad or an adult diaper, she went for a glass cup. She sat down while showing a house and sure enough, it broke and cut her up pretty bad. Between the guy putting arm blood into his penis and now this I don't think I'm gonna see my genitals again for a couple of days. I'm a corman, not a doctor, but I once had a patient tell me that there was no credible research that smoking was bad for one's health. Okay. 80 plus yo, patient who was declining with multiple diagnoses and about 3 decubitus ulcers. Daughter was adamant that her father be kept on his strict paleo diet because that would supercharge his healing. She had a stack of diet books. He simply wasn't getting enough nutrition to heal the ulcers. He didn't like the diet at all btw. At some point you kind of have to stop being polite and just tell patients family members bluntly that you don't have time for this crap and what you recommend and they can do what they want and just document everything. It happens a lot but she sticks out. I am a dental student. One patient in particular is pathological liar. During one visit, they claimed to have gone to medical school. Next visit was that they did dental army. Last visit was that they had a PhD. The patient will say things like hey doc do you need me to move my head mesial or distal number? I need you to move your head right. Hey doc, are these cavities being caused by the anaerobic pathology microbes number? They are caused by you eating snacks all day and not brushing. A patient was admitted for anemia and a localized cancer was found. She was referred to surgery so she can get cured from her localized cancer and she started telling everyone that it was the doctors who caused the cancer and that she was doing just fine before coming to the hospital. She lectured the surgeon and my colleague, who pleaded her to get her surgery, so that the cancer doesn't advance, and yet she refused, saying she knew better and probably didn't even have cancer. Some people, this kind of reminds me of my brother, he told me that when he was younger, 5 or 6 years old. He thought that when a doctor diagnosed you with a disease, it means that they actually gave you that disease. The only difference is, he quickly realized this wasn't the case and didn't become a freaking idiot like this lady. <laughs> Nurse here. The number of American 20-something males who don't know what circumcision is is ridiculously high. They think that boys are born circumcised. Evidence. New fathers. And mothers. Asking me what's wrong with their newborn son's penis. Um. 
he still has his foreskin. Many parents choose to have it removed when the baby is a couple days old. It's called circumcision. Often followed by a parent's question, what circumcision that's when I face palm. Dead serious. We talked about circumcision in my grade 6 health class but saw any pictures. I am and had absolutely no idea until I was in high school. I knew what it was but had nothing to compare it to. This was pre-Google. Was working at a pediatric urgent care. Family brings in their 3 year old unvaccinated son with autism for a weird rash. They couldn't give me any reason why when I asked them about his vaccination status. Said it before. I'll say it again. Had a patient insist. I didn't have a heart attack. I had a myocardial infarction. That's just the technical term for a heart attack. Genius. Patient had an anoxic brain injury from drug overdose. She was 23. Her father demanded a brain matter transplant and oxygen directly put into her brain to fix it. But then he decided they would tratch and peg her, send her to a nursing home, and wait for a cure, because we didn't know what we were doing. I was a unit secretary and nurse aide on a radiation oncology unit in the early 2000s. We had a patient show up through the year and was admitted for emergency radiation treatment. She had a massive fungating mass in her mouth that had consumed half her head. When the radonc doc tried to examine her and open her mouth, her remaining teeth fell out into his hand. It had eaten through the bones of her face, invaded her eye socket, everything. Doc said it was the worst case of mouth cancer he'd seen. According to her husband, she had a small lesion on her hard palate, and upon receiving the diagnosis of an early stage squamous cell carcinoma, she decided to treat with essential oils and things like frankincense because chemo was poison. Her husband said he had tried to reason with her but she was adamant about the natural treatment. She died in agony shortly after. You know I usually adamantly refuse to allow my happiness to be disrupted by stuff on the internet. But it's stuff like this that makes me feel justified in allowing myself to be triggered when I see someone I know on Facebook posting horrible misinformation from somewhere like Natural News. ORN here, not a physician, but you may find this interesting. Young adult male presents with multiple abscesses on various parts of his body. States he injected his boyfriend's semen into himself trying to get pregnant. He tells one of the APCs he should have gone with his original plan and tried on his dog first. Psych clears him. He's admitted to the floor and gets IV antibiotics. What? I've seen enough of Reddit today. Doctors and nurses of Reddit. What's the worst thing y'all've seen on the job? Alright. This one is really, really bad. Like, really bad. Do not read this if you're pregnant, your spouse is pregnant or you are trying to get pregnant. I'm an EMT, and this is my worst story. Back when I was fairly new to running emergency calls my partner and I got a call for a woman who was in premature labor and bleeding. We grabbed another person on scene to drive. Since we wanted to concentrate on the woman, we do the usual things, IV, blood pressure, which was really effing high, strap in for transport, etc. This is where things go very, very wrong. While we're on the way to her, her blood pressure starts to spike even higher, and she's involuntarily pushing. Her entire uterus detaches internally and falls out. Literally, I don't know how much people know about the blood flow required for pregnancy, but when a woman is pregnant all sorts of veins and arteries are formed attaching the fetus to the womb and the blood flow to the womb is enormous. So where they're in the back of the bus, everything is covered in blood, like, coated. There's a pool of blood on the floor we're splashing in. The mother is, of course, unconscious or dead. We don't even know. The only thing we could do was basically put the womb back in the woman and hold pressure until we got to the hospital. Obviously, neither the woman nor the child survived, and we literally had to remove blood from our rig for 8 hours. The entirety of our remaining shift, it even coated the ceiling. And that's my worst story. Nothing has ever topped it, and I don't think anything ever will. I'm really happy I don't have nightmares, because I know my partner did. My sister, gynecologist, told me this one. Girl comes to hospital, complains that she's unusually smelly down there. Sister takes a look, sure enough there is something not right there. Upon further inspection my sister notices there is an object deep inside her. Sister, there seems to be something stuck inside your birth canal. Do you know what it could be? I'm going to take it out. Patient, no please don't touch that. It's the cap to my deodorant. I'm keeping it there as a contraceptive. 
Sister, what? A friend who was a field medic in the army told me this story. While he was in training at a military hospital, they would provide free medical attention to civilians that couldn't afford it on their own. He said that a black woman in her 70s came in with what turned out to be a prolapsed rectum. But that's not the interesting part. When they went to roll her onto her side, one of the guys grabbed her arm and it just flopped freely like it was just hanging on by skin. They freaked and said are you okay? Does that hurt? She replied nah, that's no big deal. I just have a bad arm. As it turns out, when she was 16 years old, she fell down and completely dislocated her shoulder. They didn't have access to medical attention, so she just lived with it like that for 50 plus years. She just conceded that she would never use that arm. He said that it could have been reset very easily without surgery, if they would have taken care of it when it happened. This story makes me so sad every time I think of it. I am an EMT, so not a doctor or nurse. But this story makes even my surgeon friends nauseous. A few years back I got a call over my radio saying that there was a trapped woman in her home who needed medical assistance. I was the first responder, so I go into the house with my bag and immediately I'm hit by a wall of stench. Now, this odor is not just the, oh god, you need to air this place out, odor. It's the sweet mother of god, I can taste it, it's in my eyes, I have to burn the clothes I'm wearing, odor. Obviously this woman was some kind of hoarder, there were cats everywhere, they were just sitting on top of crap that had piled up in the house, there was cat crap on the walls, the floor. I saw families of cockroaches skittering around. Disgusting. So I called out to identify myself as a paramedic and I hear this woman calling me from down the hallway. As I pick my way through the house the odor just gets worse. It was like someone crap covered themselves in baby vomit and then rolled around in a field of rotting flesh. I come to an open door and lo and behold there is the woman. This woman had to weigh at least 450 pounds. She was naked, covered in crap and wedged between her toilets and her bathtub. I nearly lost my god dang mind. The desire to vomit was so intense. I asked her what happened, donned my gloves, as well as a mask, and started to think of how the frick I was going to get this woman out. I'm not small, but dang I'm not Hercules. It's about this time that more EMTs start arriving, as well as a few cops. This rookie cop comes racing in, sees this woman covered in crap and vomits right onto her. This sets off a chain reaction. The woman begins to vomit. More EMTs and cops come in, and everyone is freaking vomiting. I'm standing in an inch of vomit juices that is now mingling with crap, and I'm just trying to figure out what to do. Turns out we had to call the fire department, get the jaws of life, and rip the toilet out. We didn't have a stretcher that could support this woman's weight, so we had to improvise. When we got to the other doctors and nurses looked so incredibly disgusted. Now, keep in mind we're covered in crap and vomit, with that horrible odor of the house clinging to us. We had to go into a decontamination room to get cleaned. Worst day ever. You have officially made me so happy I work with dead people and not live ones. Guy came in with severe abdominal pain. Turned out he had painful hemorrhoids which had led to him being too scared to take a dump for one month. He couldn't tolerate any of the normal treatment, laxatives and enemas, so he ended up being taken to theater where I, the most junior member of the on-call surgical team, had to claw out this monstrosity of a turd with my fingers. It was this dense mass about 4-5 inches wide that felt like hard and clay and smelled exactly how you might expect a bull of crap that's been brewing for a month to smell like. Took a good half hour before I managed to clean him out. All while the nurses tried to stand as far away as possible and my seniors peed themselves laughing at my horrified expressions. RN here. Here's my fun tale. Had a very obese man. 400 plus LBS. With a swollen scrotum. No kidding. His bow sack was the size of a basketball. Just dangling there between his legs. The gross part was when he went to sit down. Yes. He could walk a few steps with lots of help. He would grasp the handlebars of his walker and start swinging his hips back and forth. Back and forth. To get his bow sack swinging. Then, at just the right moment when his basketball sized junk was out in front. He'd sit down quickly so as not to crush anything. I pride myself deeply in being able to keep a straight face through that ritual. I never once saw a male nursing assistant who didn't choke with laughter watching him do it. 
Dad's a dentist. One night we get a call at home from the local asking if my father is willing to come in and deal with a patient because, well, they have no idea what to do with this woman. My dad is a rather stand up guy, so goes and opens his practice to treat this woman. I go along with him and help set up the room. An ambulance pulls up and wheels this elderly woman into the clinic. From the get go the first thing that hits us is the smell. Her face is bandaged up pretty well, and we can see blood seeping through the gorse and all down her shirt. Double gloves, double masks. My dad dives in. She has something penetrating her lip. It's mustard yellow, and has the consistency of rock candy. He plays with it a little bit, and a large chunk breaks off. What's attached is four of this woman's teeth. Or rather, the decayed remains of her teeth. Apparently, this 78 year old woman had never brushed her teeth a day in her life. And what had penetrated her lip was an obelisk of plaque. He continued to clean away what he could. But the plaque build up was so massive that she had literally rotten away all of her teeth and most of her gums. One spot was abscessed clear down to her jawbone. To this day he kept the chunk in a jar in his office. And scares little children into brushing their teeth every day. Mom in the air. Guy came in with a pencil and a straightened cloth changer up his urethra. Both stuck good. Apparently, the pencil was for fun and the hanger was to attempt to dig the pencil out. I don't understand that method of pencil removal. Saw a lady who had flown in from another country to have US doctors help with her breast cancer. She had a metastatic tumor on her arm that was the size of a bagel and smelled of necrotic tissue. Her chest wall was replaced by tumor and you could see her rib cage. Her family got mad that we couldn't just cut the tumor off her arm. The hole smelled like rotten flesh. Nursing student here. Had to insert a catheter into a pretty obese lady. Saw a black string hanging from her vagina. I asked her if she had a tampon in and she said oh. I hope it's not still there. I ended up having to pull it out and the stench will be with me forever. Not to mention the white pus and brown slime covering a now black tampon. Apparently she hadn't had a period in months. So who knows how long it was in there. When I was doing my ob in rotation, we had a woman come into clinic that had a condom in her birth canal. Apparently it came off during intercourse with her boyfriend, but they didn't take it out, and she waited like two weeks to come in to get a doctor to remove it. But she stunk the entire office up so badly. Most disturbing thing I can remember in recent history was someone with sister psychosis tapeworm infection of the brain. I got a script for a duel with a ridiculously high dose. I called the doctor thinking it was a mistake and he told me what was up. We both agreed there was very little chance of it working, but he said there were absolutely no other alternatives. A homeless paraplegic woman was brought into the earth for pneumonia. We had to strip off all of her dirty clothes and put her in a hospital gown. As I took her pants off, I noticed a cockroach. Which I thought was weird. As we took her panties off, out came the swarm. Roaches had nested in her birth canal and she couldn't feel it because of the paralysis. <laughs> Worked on a rural EMT team during summers off from college, and responded to a drunk driving accident. When we arrived, I thought clearly this guy has to be dead. Mostly due to the crumpled car that the firefighters had cut apart. This guy must have been drinking a lot, because there were beer bottles all over the place with broken glass shards all lodged in his skin. But that wasn't the worst part. He had the remnants of a beer bottle lodged in his neck, which in and of itself wasn't too bad. I've seen worse, except the bottle was the only thing keeping his head attached to this body. The man had decapitated himself. I'll never forget seeing his eyes moving and mouth attempting to speak, or the sick sucking sound that were emanating from his neck as he struggled to breathe. Obviously, he did not survive the night. My mom worked for a urologist. She came home with the story of this guy that had a master lock attached through his dong. He misplaced the key and was looking to get it off. He also rode his bike to the office. They had to refer him to the hospital to remove the lock. Not as gross as some stories I've read, but this is one my mother told me after a night working the air. A guy came in with his dong broke sideways. He said my girlfriend got a little too excited. Another one where my dad was driving an ambulance. It was time to remove a cast for a very large woman who broke her leg. He was sent to pick her up. She never got up from her chair since getting out of the hospital. For months she crap and peed herself in her recliner. My mother is the one who removed the cast. The cast was full of cockroaches and roach eggs. 
They said the ambulance and the exam room smelled for days. Student psychiatric nurse here. While on a ward for the elderly suffering from dementia I had one experience I will never forget. A lady, let's call her Betty, was in the corridor outside her room. The first thing I noticed were her hands, covered in feces. Oh Betty, did you have some trouble in the bathroom hey? It happens. Sometimes when you're older you may be a bit shaky or confused, and I'm not one to judge the unwell. Let's get you washed up then. We move into her bedroom when the smell hits me. For a second I just stare and try to take in what has happened. What follows is my brain process. Traces of feces are everywhere. On the walls. On the wardrobe. On her clean clothes. On her bed. On the door. That's okay. We can clean this. But I can't see any major. Uh. Movement. From which it would have come from. But wait. There's something on the floor. As if someone had defecated on the floor and. Picked it up. Yes. There's slide marks from someone obviously mov. Oh my god. She has shat on her dinner plate. I saw. On her bedside table. A plate piled high with feces. I'm not kidding. At least 6 inches. On top of the food. And I just stood there and stared for what felt like an eternity. More like 5 seconds I guess. Before calling someone to give me a hand. Perhaps it was a political statement about the state of the food in the hospital. I don't know. Regardless, I now have the best party dinner table story. Not mine, but my sister. She was working at an old folks center near our house, and she was with this one older gentleman. On his hip, was a black hair the size of a dime. On top of a decent sized lump, about 2 inches long, an inch wide and half an inch tall. So she threw on some gloves, and squeezed the black head, with the permission of the man of course. Out popped this roll of gauze that was left over from his hip surgery 10 years prior that he never bothered to get removed. Apparently the smell was horrid and she will never forget it. Here's a story from my cousin, who's in med school currently. There was a PCP who went to some part of Africa for the Peace Corps. When he came back, he found he was always more tired than he was when he left for Africa. One day he felt a pulsation in his eye and went to the air. Once there, the doctor found a small worm wriggling around in his eye. The worm normally lives near the brain, but had somehow made its way out from there and into his eye. The doctor hadn't seen anything like it and called in another doctor to come and look at it. By the time the other doctor got there, the worm had made its way back out of the eye. Cut to about a month later and the PCP feels the pulsation again. But instead of returning to the hospital, he decided to take care of it himself. He takes a needle and heats it up using the stove. He then puts it into his own eye in order to remove the parasite. Over the course of the next year or two, he removes, if I remember correctly, around 5 of the worms this way before feeling better. My mother was once lifting up the folds of fat on an obese person to check for abnormalities and found a biscuit. I found a dead mouse in the fat folds. Closest I've been to vomiting. Not a doctor or a nurse, combat medic in the army. A girl came into the clinic complaining of pain in her vag, and when he went to examine her he found she was having thick grey oozing discharge. He tried to prescribe her medication for it, but she refused to take it. Why? Because her boyfriend liked the taste. My dad is a doctor in the intensive care unit. One day he had a lady who was crossing the street when a coach bus ran her over. She was dragged for two blocks before someone stopped the bus. She came into the hospital missing like 80% of her skin and was disemboweled but conscious for the whole thing. Girlfriend a nurse. Early one morning a man came in with a broken off plunger up his butt. He was sodomizing himself when it somehow broke off. Splintered his finger and lodged itself deep within his rectal cavity. Needless to say it was quite gross to remove and looked incredibly painful. A woman came in with complaints of abdominal pain. Screaming about how her baby was dead. Her record showed absolutely nothing about her being pregnant. After having her change into a gown, the most ungodly stench filled the room. My doc began a pelvic exam, with me as a standby. I will never forget his face as he removed a pinkish brown clotted mass. A chicken leg. Turns out her baby was an uncooked chicken she chopped up and inserted into her birth canal. Her baby might not have been dead, but that chicken sure was. My roommate is a nurse and there is a homeless guy that comes to her regularly. Apparently this guy had a major surgery in the last 10 years where they removed something from his stomach. 
or that general area. After the surgery he woke up and just left the hospital without letting himself healing. He proceeded to do drugs such as M and his body was never able to heal properly. Apparently he comes to the ER about once every week to rebandage his intestines. The nurses have to rinse and sanitize the intestines and rebandage him up every time he comes in. They simply take a large bandage and wrap it around his midsection. He has been seen outside the hospital holding his intestines with a plastic bag pressed to his stomach while smoking cigarettes. Doctors and medical professionals of Reddit, what one medical fact do you wish everybody knew? Your immune system is one of the greatest assets you have and you never thank it. In your life, your body will autonomously eradicate between 6-10 cancers without your realizing. It will fight your infections, repair micro traumas and police the entire population of billions of cells in your body without your asking. All it requests in return is a little bit of health to preserve it. Stop smoking, lose weight, maybe exercise a little, don't drink so much. Your diet is so much more important that you realize. If you want to keep hands fingers upper limbs intact, do not punch a wall card or guy in the face brick, etc. You will end up with a boxer's fracture, or a break of your fifth metacarpal bone. Most of the time everyone will know you were drunk when it happened and it's not comfortable or fun. Do not reach into the chute of a running snowblower, even if it stopped because something is stuck in there. Do not attempt to fix your chain driven garage door opener by putting your fingers in the track and asking your wife to hit the button. Do not reach into an auger at work trying to retrieve your safety glove that just fell in there. Do not hold on to something at work that winches rope. If you have a wound on your hand fingers arm, and it is using something that looks green, yellow, white, or pink, Go to the doctor and have it looked at. You may save yourself from an amputation. Source. I'm an RN at an orthopedic surgery center. All of these things have happened numerous times. And yes. Archaic as it seems. Sometimes people have to get fingers or even hands amputated. In this day and age. Because they ignored an infection. <laughs> Nurse here. If you're an alcoholic that's admitted to the hospital. Don't lie about how much you drink. There are drugs we can give you to take the edge off of withdrawals. It's safer for you and safer for us. We're not judging you. We have safety in mind. When I was on my pharmacy rotations, I remember a guy in the IQ for alcohol withdrawal. He was having such strong tremors that even benzodiazepines couldn't stop. He was there for a whole week. At that point, I promised myself not to have more than two beers at a time. Keep an eye on your weight. Rapid unintentional weight loss is often a sign something serious is up. Or gain. Was in the air last night. Overheard guy in front of me that he gained around 30 pounds in 2 weeks and could no longer walk. Based off his swollen abdomen and wet lungs I thought he was in congestive heart failure. He was roomed near me and it turns out that's exactly what he has. If your kid has a fever, and you give them Tylenol or Ibuprofen to bring it down, they are still freaking sick. You're only treating symptoms temporarily, not curing anything. For the love of everything holy, do not give them Tylenol and send them to school daycare sports birthday parties etc. To become patient zero and infect everyone else. I think there's a phenomenon for this, the 11 o'clock spike, which is when the meds wear off and the kid is feverish, and then the mom is pee when you call her to come get the kid. Doctor here. Most important rule. Know your own history and drugs. Our EMRs are too inefficient to depend on. Especially if you've been to many different institutions. Yes yes yes. It's in the computer is not enough and even if you are in the same town at a different health system and we can see some of your data from your usual doc EMRs are still pretty bad at talking to each other. If you have tons of meds make a list. Also when you get asked about if you have any medical problems diabetes and high blood pressure count, not just cancer and heart attacks. It's significantly more effective to prevent cancer than it is to treat it, but the world isn't interested because most people just want a pill to fix their problems. Don't smoke, wear sunscreen, don't drink excessively, get a bit of exercise and eat some goddamn vegetables, do those and bam, huge drop in cancer risk, but nobody wants to hear it. The pregnancy test you get in the air is no different from the one at the store and equally accurate. Viral infections cannot be treated with antibiotics. But that placebomycin though. Doctor here. Keep things out of your ears. Seriously. Safety professional here. 
This does not apply to earplugs in loud environments. If exercise were a pill, it would be the most prescribed drug in existence. While elective brain surgery doesn't test that great, it still tests better than darting and exercise. Better off Ted. Volunteer saw ship crew member here. When you suspect whoever is lying down is not breathing by themselves, begin CPR immediately and do not stop until medical professional arrives, even if this means that you have to go on for several hours. We do not perform CPR to have the patient miraculously wake up and make out with us. We do this to sustain the most vital bodily function, the circulation of oxygen to the brain, until we can get that person to a hospital. Stay at home with Neurovirus. Call and ask for advice don't come in and infect a bunch of possibly already ill people. Mental illness can be as serious as a physical one. Get treated, you wouldn't let a broken leg go. Bipolar disorder made me lose months of my life I do not remember and made me almost kill myself. Talk to your doctors if you're not feeling okay. Dentist here. Just because a toothache goes away, doesn't mean it's all better. Many times it's the calm before the abscess. It goes from dying, to dead, to abscessed in as fast as a day or sooner. Drug allergies and side effects are not the same thing. It makes you look like a crazy person when you have 20 allergies and 19 of the reactions are nausea. Epinephrine makes my heart race. Dot. Yes, that's part of how it works. 1. Reverse cowgirl may be a fun position for you but please be careful girls. 2. Blood in your pee when not associated with pain and fever is something you need to get checked out. 3. Get that new ugly mole checked, especially if it is painful or bleeds spontaneously. 4. Boys, if you notice some irregularity growth in your balls please get it checked early. If your ball is the size of a grapefruit, ignoring it will not make it go away. It will just increase the risk of worse news than that you are fearing. It is much better to be labeled a worried well than the alternative. If we are stressed or rushed for time it's not personal, it's the system. We may not always say it but we are grateful for those who take responsibility for their health. The human rectum is nightmarishly elastic. Go on. Doc here. If you suspect a heart attack take an aspirin or two. Not ibuprofen. Not paracetamol. Not some other dumbass analgesic painkiller. An actual aspirin. Also get yourself to a hospital. Duh. But that aspirin might save your life. Vaccines are safe and save lives. No. You're just trying to make us autistic. You should not stop an antibiotic treatment because you feel better already. Seriously. This is how we get super bugs people. Avoid grapefruit and grapefruit juice if you are taking some kind of medication. About 50% of pharmaceuticals on the market are metabolized at least in part by CYP3A4, which is inhibited by compounds found in grapefruit. A doc here. Medical fact. Emergency means potential loss of life, limb, or eyesight. It does not mean inconvenience, irritation, or chronic condition. Your sore throat evaluation in the ED is gonna cost you $1000. Go to an urgent care. Just don't lie to us. We don't judge you because your poop is smelly or you like to put things up there. Remember always, we've seen something far, far worse than the gerbil up your butt. Oh and don't freaking drink and drive. Some new updates because no one learns. I work in a burn unit. Don't put accelerants on a camp bonfire. Don't go back into a burning house vehicle airplane. Don't put accelerants on bonfires. This includes aerosol cans of stuff. Those blow up. Don't make them unless you have an advanced degree in the field. Don't put accelerants on bonfires. Even if it just won't light. Don't let your pod handles hang over the edge of the stove where your kid can reach. Don't put accelerants on bonfires. Even if you've been doing it for years. Don't pick up containers of flaming grease and oil. Don't put accelerants on bonfires. Diesel is an accelerant. Don't keep electric cigarettes in your pocket. If you wear oxygen, don't smoke with it on in your lap. Don't burn trash. You don't know what the frick's in there. Probably accelerants. Stop opening your radiator cap unless the car is cold. Carburetor injuries are common. I don't know how it happens. Help me out car people. Don't. Put accelerants on your gadam fire. Know the signs of a heart attack and stroke and don't tough it out. These are time sensitive and potentially deadly events. 
Paramedic here. Super frustrating when I get a patient who didn't call early enough and because of that they can't get life saving treatment or the damage is already done. It sucks when you have anxiety. The symptoms of a panic attack are awfully similar to a heart attack. I don't have the money to visit the O every time, so I admit to ignoring it. Some of my symptoms last for days. Not a medical fact, as much as it's just something I wish all patients would do, I'd love it if patients could bring a sheet of paper with all the meds they're on. Past medical history, past surgical history, allergies, and family doctor contact info. It's a small thing, but can be so helpful. Nurse and midwife here. I wish people understood that if they are receiving treatment for a condition, they still have that condition. Case in point, if you're taking medication for something you aren't suddenly free of that disease, your blood pressure meds are maintaining a normal blood pressure because you have the condition of high blood pressure. Your insulin is maintaining your blood sugars because you have diabetes. Sounds simple but amazing how much people tell us they have no conditions but are on 1000 medications that tell a different story. I had one lady come into the ED with complaints of headaches. Stated that she'd been diagnosed with HIV 9 years prior. Hasn't taken any meds in the past 3 years because I'm undetectable and that means the virus is barely there anymore. Ended up having giant abscesses in her brain that required neurosurgical intervention. Not a doctor but something a doctor told me when the incident occurred. Girls if you get excruciating cramps at the time of your period and it feels much worse than it actually is. Go to a doctor. When I was 13 I had already been confirmed to having a ovarian cyst, and it made it very painful for me during my periods to the point where I had passed out from the pain of it once. However at one point it felt much worse than it typically did and I blew it off as being because of my period. It turned out my appendix was bursting. The doctor told me a lot of women blow off period cramps because doctors tend to do the same. Don't, it almost meant life or death for me. I used to get such bad PMS that I would be vomiting, cramps where I was curled up crying, bad mood swings, the works. The doctor told me the pain was normal and I would grow out of it. Frick you, doctor. Turns out what I was going through was not normal, and my new doctor is great. Vet tech. Your cat is probably obese. So many people free choice their cats because it's easier or just way overfeed their cats because cats whine a lot. You're not doing your cat any favors. He is going to get diabetes. I'd guess that about 10% of cats I've seen are actually at a healthy weight. Get a good one toy and play with your cat every day and for god's sake limit how much they eat. Also, treats are supposed to be less than 10% of your pet's caloric intake. Cool it with the treats. Sadly a lot of children get the same treatment. Doctor here. Don't stop your medications by yourself. Just don't. No matter how good you feel. Patients stop antibiotics and relapse. So many resistant TB cases here. Stop taking insulin and come with DKA. Stop taking antihypertensives and get a stroke. Don't stop any drug unless cleared prior with your doctor. Most of the diseases can only be managed. They can't really be cured. If you have diabetes, get sugar levels tested at least once a month. Don't ignore it. Don't mix alcohol and antidepressants. Also, no matter how bad it is, we have seen worse. Don't be ashamed. Pull out doesn't mean she won't get pregnant. Precum has sperm too. Last, if you see anyone vomiting and loss conscious, turn them to their side. Less chances of it entering lungs. RPH here. Do not keep your medicine in your medicine cabinet in your bathroom. The steam from a shower and the temperature fluctuations will degrade your medication. Keep them in a cool dry place away from direct sunlight. Also look through your OTC items in your house and clean out the expired drugs and restock your basics. Ibuprofen, acetaminophen, pepto, eye drops, etc. I may be alone in this. But I want my patients to know that there is no possible way I can keep up with all the medical advances and new studies that are out there. And I also want them to know that there are thousands of conditions that I learned about in medical school that I've forgotten because I've never seen or recognized them in practice. This is important. Because my patients frequently apologize for looking up things on the internet. No. Don't apologize. I want you to research your condition. I want you to look things up. I want you to know about new treatments, new research, 
and alternative medications. Because often I don't. I may not agree with the things you've read, and that's fine too. Ask me about things you've read and the picture you found that looks like your ash. I can't tell you how many times a patient has come to me with a suggestion about a possible explanation for symptoms because they read about it on the internet that turned out to be a correct or at least reasonable guess. Please educate yourselves about yourselves. Some good websites are the CDC website and AAFP.org, the American Academy of Family Practice, and if your doctor is offended that you're trying to be educated, get a different doctor. Source, I'm a doctor. Smoking not only causes cancer, but also arteriosclerosis, COPD and multiple other problems you're much more likely to encounter when smoking. Keep an up to date list of all the medication you take, including doses, and bring it with you whenever you are seeking health care. If you say that you take two white pills and an orange one, that's so vague as to be useless. Being involved in your own care by making sure to have specific and accurate information is very helpful. In a situation where first aid is required it is better to do something than to be scared and not do anything. You might save someone's life. Doctors are there to help you. Stop lying to them. They have to protect your privacy. So if you're doing drugs, tell them. They have to keep it secret, and it could kill you if you don't. Doctors might not snitch but the insurance company gets to see their records. Clinical psychologist here. If you need mental health treatment, Try your local college campuses. Oftentimes there are training clinics, supervised by some of the best clinicians around. Most will provide a generous sliding fee scale. Treatment works, especially for sleep problems, depression, anxiety, PTSD, etc. Also do not ignore mental health problems in your children or adolescents including when you are concerned about substance use. Early intervention works best and if you wait until they are 18, they may not get treatment for another decade because they refuse to go in until they mature in their late 20s. So if your child or adolescent is showing signs of a mood or anxiety disorder, cutting, struggling with ADHD, and is using drugs regularly, weekly or more, and you are concerned consider an intake assessment with a licensed psychologist. Former M's here. Don't get angry when that quiet person gets taken out of the awaiting room before you. You have a headache and are raging and I can't help you. But that person who just got taken back is quiet for a reason. You're not dying. Death is quiet. I can't tell you how many times I took someone to the air yelling and kicking and screaming and when we roll up and they get looked at it's often minor. I've seen people who I had a feeling would not make it. They don't rave like idiots. They lay still and quiet and it's almost eerie. Speaking from my own personal experience, the few times I've been in severe pain I was not making any noise. All of my concentration and focus was on the pain. I could barely talk let alone wail and moan. Don't lie to us. It never works out. And if your pee is a different color, don't ignore it. Seek help. Except after you eat beetroot. Stop fricking smoking. I know it's hard. I know you're addicted. Just stop fricking smoking. Pee after sex. Any sex. Just do it. All kinds of bacteria get pushed up your urethra. UTs suck. If you get in an accident as a biker, don't take your helmet off your head under any circumstances. You can unhook the strap if you really need to to not suffocate. But that's it. Stop reading here if you're faint of heart. Many times, your head will break like an egg and the helmet is basically the only thing preventing your skull from being skewered by your cranium shards or spilling out. Not necessarily a medical fact, but, please carry an up to date list of medications in your wallet, or take a picture of your various pill bottles at home and keep it on your phone. Despite what everyone thinks, everything about you isn't in the system. If you're sexually active, go for STI testing once or twice a year. HIV can take up to 6 months to show and it's possible to have an STI with no symptoms. Well, endocrinologist here and I have to let off steam. Last month I lost a 24 year old patient to diabetes. Seriously, people, visceral fat is freaking serious. Sometimes I see people mocking their potbelly as if it's not a big deal, but it is. You have no idea how many silent illnesses you may be developing in your body by not monitoring your weight. You have been visited by the safety steward little. 
upvote in 16 seconds for 16 years of safe grinds. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.